Can you guys see the slinky camera? Beanie. Yep. You see it? Beanie. Yep. Thank you. There we go. Hey. Beanie cam, got it. Uh-huh. Right here. I love you. Thank you. I just, I just hide it, man. Right here, right here, right here. I, I get it from you. Perfect. Right here. Right here. Right here, buddy. Is that tape to go out, Arch? Awesome. One more. I'm going to boost you up. One, two, three. Hey, yeah, give her a hand. I'm your host, J.O. Benjamin, and we are here with our special guest, David E. Tauber. Y'all give a round of applause. <laughs> I mean, director, writer, producer. I mean, all around creative. We need to know more about this path. And so we like to jump right into it. All right. Who was David at Central High School? I was the corny kid uh, who wore, I remember I had a corduroy blazer that I wore to school and a tie and shoes, and I had a briefcase. And they used to say, man, man, you, 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 you corny, you know? But uh, it's the corny dude, it's all right with embracing your corny, because you see what, what it does, you know, for you. And uh, so I, I never minded being different, you know? And, uh, and I remember one of my, one of my best friends, uh, Conrad, we were all in the corny, corny group, and um, I used to always ask him to do things for me, you know, like, uh, you know, I need you to get me this. He said, man, 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 we don't work for you. You act like you Elvis, as we <laughs> say, you know, like, 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 like we work for him. But um, that was a boss in me that was uh, bubbling inside. And not that you direct people, but you organize things as a director. You're the CEO of a company and a company is a set of that film. Yeah. And uh, so you have to be able to lead people. You know, so that was, that's who I was in high school, but all that is because I'm three generations child of uh, holiness preachers. So my great grandmother was a pastor and one of the founding pastors of the PAW movement in DC. And um, that's Pentecostal Assemblies of the World. And uh, so I grew up with her running her own business, which was the church. She was in the business of saving souls and helping people uh, enhance their lives. And so, and so I was, you know, I grew up around a boss. Yeah. And she was Jesus' boss. She was God's boss. She was, you know, she handled his business. And so that's kind of like who I, who I was. Yeah. So I'm curious then, is there a particular sermon or moment that you reflect back on, that you experienced with your grandmother, um, that still to today motivates you and inspires you? Yeah, I think it's just all those scriptures. You know, you, 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 you grow up and you, you, you got to recite scriptures in Sunday school and like, oh my God, you just recite them. You don't know what, what they mean. They don't mean <laughs> nothing to you. You're just trying to not get a whipping at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, but one of my favorite ones is I once was young and now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. Uh -huh. And I didn't understand what that was, but you know, as I've been, I've been doing this 30 years, and so I don't question whether or not it's going to be successful. I don't question whether or not uh, it's going to turn out because I remember what David said in the Psalms. I once was young. Now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. God has never not provided for me when I was a young man. So what makes me think as I get older that he won't do the same? And I'm sure that particular scripture has carried you, right, mm -hmm. throughout your career and experiences. Mm -hmm. A little birdie might have told me that you was an athlete mm -hmm. and you were actually playing basketball. Mm -hmm. What was that moment like um, when you realized it was time to pivot from playing basketball? I think I heard in one of your speeches you were like playing around at the, the local court mm -hmm. and that's where injury actually happened. So. 
Yeah. Could you describe that moment for us? Well, I thought I was going to be the NBA, but I grew up, uh, you know, until I was 12, I grew up in a white neighborhood around white people. Gotcha. And I was the biggest, baddest, blackest, fastest. <laughs> <laughs> then my mama got remarried and moved to the hood. And I was the slowest, whitest, weakest, you know, <laughs> in there. So I'm like, man, what I thought I was good, <laughs> these brothers sit here for wearing me out. And I'm like, oh, man, I need to pivot here. I, 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 I should have started off early as a black man, much, much earlier. Than I was, but uh, so so then you know I I kept I I, I said I wasn't going to let that um, stop me. Yeah. So actually, the brothers that I grew up with, my best friends uh, Chuck and Mo, they brought my game up because they were so, so much better than me. And but I was hanging around people that were better, and it elevated my game. And I'm like, wait a second, now I got them and. I said, I'm, I'm tall and I can figure this thing out. So I was just working. I would come up every morning, do wind sprints, you know, dribble. One of the cats from the neighborhood was coaching me. I was going around the track and I was just, and, and I woke up and I came back next summer and my boy Chuck, who was the best one, yeah. I mean, we were going out really breaking <laughs> ankles. I'm like, whoa. And I said, okay, this is on. So went to Morgan State HBCU and got a, a scholarship there. And then one morning I was just up practicing with some old heads. Uh, don't 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 practice with old heads, y'all, because you know they they they're bitter because their career didn't go the way they wanted. <laughs> so they gonna make sure yours doesn't. So I was up there breaking the old cast ankles right, and one of them, you know, I guess was a little salty, and so I went up. He came down on my ankle, and uh, I fractured my ankle, and uh, it it never set right. And that's when I said, well, you know, I, I, basketball isn't my thing. And I was at Morgan. They, they, they took my scholarship away from me. Wow. And uh, I was just sitting in the, in the, in the uh, student lounge. And this one girl that we knew, uh, I overheard her talking to her friends that she was uh, on the radio. And I'm like, I'm like, what, what radio? She says, our radio. I'm like, we got a radio station? <laughs> yes. Fool, we got a radio station. I'm like, okay. And and I said, and they let you on it? And she's like, yes. And I'm like, okay. And I said to my boy, now, they let her on the radio. I know I, I, I know I can get a radio. So I got that corduroy jacket. <laughs> I got my, my briefcase. And I went there. And uh, and he, I, he I, I told him I wanted to be on the radio. And, and, and he said he'd give me an interview the next next morning and so the radio station was 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 filthy I mean it looked like it ain't been clean since uh, reconstruction you know um, and and you know they didn't have a lot of money in black colleges and everything so I called my boy Bootsy up that night he went uh, my best friend in Morgan and I said come back and meet me at the radio station like like what's going on and so we got the bucket that was in the the closet, whatever, and you know, we jimmy the lock and got in there, and I cleaned the whole radio station. I mean, we put carpet fresh on it, it you know, and so the next day I came back for the interview, and uh, I'm interviewing with the guy. I said, Yeah, so look at man, we don't have that many slots. And he looked around and says, Hmm, look around and says, Hmm, smell different. He says, Oh, look at man, we don't have many slots. He says, Uh, hey. Did a cleaning crew come in here and clean this place? And they said, no. Nah. And he says, hmm, well, look here, we don't, he's touching the table. He says, now nah, somebody came in here and cleaned this room because this place ain't, I ain't never seen this place clean. I'm sitting in the interview and, and he said, no, nah, man, ain't nobody come and clean this place. And he says, so look here, man. I said, well, he says, damn, man, this place is clean. It smell good, too. And I said, yeah, I said, that's the pine fresh that we put on there and the carpet fresh we put on. He said, what you talking about, man? I said, well, I had my boy come back last night and we cleaned up the place. He says, you cleaned up the place? I said, yeah, we vacuumed, we put carpet fresh, we cleaned wow. around the, you know, the studio. And he says, why? And I said, because uh, it needed it. Mm. And he says, hmm. He opened up his book, he says, uh, I think we got a slot for you, uh, young man. <laughs> he said, we'll give you a chance on Tuesday, and if that works out, maybe we'll add it to Thursday. I ended up being, at, at 19 years old, one of the biggest talk show hosts on that radio station, and that started my career as a radio announcer, which got me out to, when I graduated, to the West Coast. I was a, 
I was a radio announcer in San Francisco, 107.7 KSOL, the Bay Area's best ride in music, always at least 20 in a row, continuous music station is Big Daddy. That's what I call it. It's Big Daddy. Oh my. I mean, you literally saw something, you saw a need, and you addressed it without even being asked. Yeah. I mean, just the talent to be able to humble yourself. And it's cleaning, too. It wasn't even in the same, like, job role mm -hmm. that you thought you, that you wanted, mm -hmm. right? You was like, but I know how to fix this problem. Mm -hmm. How has that talent or personality trait of being a problem solver really worked out in your career? Well, that's what I do now. I'm always going to exceed expectations. I'm always going to add value. You know, yeah. when you're an add value person, then people always want you around. Yeah. You know, people say, well, man, can you, can you, can you help me uh, uh, get my, my play on the ground or help me with my script? But, but you, haven't, you haven't done anything to help me. Yeah. You know, um, and, and life relationships are relationships of exchange. That means, that means if I see you're willing to give, yeah. then, then you're going to get something from me. That's how relationships work. And, you know, I ask a, a lot of people, I look for the person and say, hey, Mr. Talbert, is there something I can get for you? And I'm like, no, I'm good. And they're like, man, well, no, no, you're not, brother. You know, I got you such and such. such. And like, oh, man, man, thank you. He says, hey, man, if you need something, uh, wipe your face or something, and I got you. I say, I'm good. No, you're not, brother. Hey, man, here's a tissue <laughs> and all this stuff. And then I, then, then I always say, what's your name, man? Yeah. And uh, such and such. And I said, now, now, what's it you want to do? And, and they say such and such. And I say, well, well you know, you know, here, here's my contact, why don't, why don't we get together? Because that person is an add value kind of person. Yep. And if, that, if, they're, if they're that way with me with my water, how well would they be on a set of a film with a camera? How well would they be in a script? That is an attitude that you must have always. I tell my son all the time, uh, when he walks into the kitchen to get his uh, bowl of cereal or whatever, it could be, bags of uh, trash on the floor. It could be a cracked eggshell on there. And my man will step over the eggshell, <laughs> over the thing. And, and, and I'm teaching him to, wherever you are, make your environment better. Yeah. What, whatever you can put your hands to do, do that, because that becomes who you are. That's why on the set of a film, when we were, you know, on any of my movies, any of my plays, Whatever budget they gave me, I'm gonna make it look like it was twice as much money that they gave me. Why? Because I'm gonna add value. If you give me $10, I'm gonna make it look like it's $20. Uh, if you give me $10 million, I'm gonna look like, make it look like you gave me $20 million. Well, um, and that's just who I am as a human being, and it spills over into my art. But you have to be an add value kind of person because it will affect everything you do in your life. Who was the first person when you landed in LA that you was like, I have to add value to this, this matter? And they really took, uh, took you under their wing for like mentorship, sponsorship. Well, it was, it was the, it was, uh, it wasn't, I got out here to the Bay Area. So it was Oakland, San Francisco, but yeah. I went to, I had a radio gig in, um, when I was my senior year at a radio gig in uh, Canton, Ohio. And I went to this church. Uh, of course, my grandmother said, baby, you know, whatever you do, you make sure your hips find a pew on Sunday morning. Absolutely. Uh, and I'm like, so, you know, I go to, I went to church there and uh, I saw, oh my God, it was this beautiful young lady that was at the church, and I was like, I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to her. I wasn't listening to anything the preacher was saying, so, so the, the the church piled out. I got up, I was looking for her, the you know, the crowd, and everything, and she was gone. I'm like, oh, are you kidding me? And they said, well, we got a we got a uh, night service, uh, you know, coming in. I said, I'm coming back to night service. I'm gonna see this young lady, meet her again. So I come back there to the night service, and. Um, I'm looking around. There's nobody. She is. She not around. So I'm like, well, let, let me let me put the you know the finger up. That's a church finger. You know, you you put the church finger up so you can get up and you can bounce up out of there. And so they close the usher closed the door to get out of church. So I'm like, uh, and then the preacher got up and says, Oh, the Lord has led me. <laughs> 
to pray for everybody in this church. Close the doors of the church and I let nobody out. I'm like, are you kidding me? Because <laughs> there was like 400 people in this church. I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm like, you know, and then now everybody rushing in. I'm in the back of the lines so of one hour, two hour. He doing them old Negro spiritual oh, yeah. prayers oh, yeah. that never end, you know, uh, you know, them, them long ones. And so it gets up, I get up there to the front. I'm like three hours in <laughs> and, and he says, what's your name? And I said, David, he said, excuse me. I said, Dave, David, he said, David, what? I said, David Talbert. He looked at me, he says, he says, uh, the Lord has, has told me to rename you brother junior. And I said, <laughs> okay. And he says, and the Lord told me that you have a gift. Mm. And I'm like, okay, this is what every, every preacher says, you got a gift. I'm like, okay. He says, he says uh, as a storyteller. Wow. And I said, okay. And, uh, and he says, and the Lord told me you need a big brother. And I'm going to be your big brother. And so every single night, I'm here for all week long, you're going to sit in the front pew. <laughs> and, and, and that's what you're going to do. And, uh, and, and you're going to drive me back and forth from the hotel to the church every night. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> so I'm like, okay. So this dude, I take him uh, back to his hotel, and we end up talking like all night. And, and he ended up being like a big brother to me. And so he left after a week. And so I go back to Morgan to finish my last year. And I'm working at the big radio station there in D.C. And two weeks before I graduate, I said, you know, I said, uh, you know, is there any way I can get, you know, anywhere, any stations outside of D.C.? Yeah. And he says, yeah, we got one. He says, but you probably don't know anybody. I think we got one in, uh, in San Francisco, but you probably don't know anybody out there. I said, well, I met this pastor when I was in Ohio. He said he lived in California, but I've never been there. I don't know. So I called him up mm -hmm. and I said, have you heard this station called KSOL? He said, yeah, it's about 10 minutes from my house. And I said, do you, do you think if I got a job there that I could stay with you? He said, yeah. He said, I got three kids you, and a wife. You can come there and you can be a part of the family. So I ended up, I got in my car. Two weeks after I graduated, Morgan drove out to the Bay Area and lived with him for a year. Ended up being a godfather of his youngest son. Oh, but, you know, that's how... God works. Yeah. You know, when you hear all your, all your life growing up, the Lord worked, grandma would say, in mysterious ways. Go on, go on. But when you're, when, you know, God uses the people in the Bible, all the folks God used were add value kind of people. Absolutely. These were people that didn't want to be doing the things specifically that they should have been doing, but God knew they were add value people, so he knew that if he could just change their direction and get them to understand what they were supposed to be doing, then he could use them. He's not using the person that's just sitting around and lazy and just kind of waiting for somebody to bless you. God is not Santa Claus. He's mm -hmm. not, he's not, he, you know, you don't make a list for him and sit under the tree. He's going to give you the blessings. Mm -hmm. The Lord helps those who help themselves. Mm -hmm. So when you're about your business, whether it's the business of God or not, when you're about your business, then he knows he could use you. And so all, and then we'll put people in your path. We're talking about paths. Yeah. We'll put people in your, we'll put people in your path yeah. that you don't even know why that person is in your path right now. Yeah. It'll, it won't be till a year later or five years later or 10 years later. You're like, oh my God, I met this person because this was something. So God was, it is the master planner. He's, he's, he's drawing up a plan and planting seeds that are going to grow. You don't know when they're going to grow. That tree may grow a year from now, 10 years from now, but God's planting that seed and through your effort, through your work, you're watering that. Yeah. And then eventually over time you wake up and you say, look at that piece of fruit on that tree. And that's how God works. Wow. <laughs> I got goosebumps. <laughs> I mean, I mean, wow. Like when we are chasing our own desires, how God will put his will and his glory like yeah. in the path. Yeah, because the thing that we don't realize is the thing that we're chasing the most yeah. is chasing us more. Yeah, yeah. Let me say that again. Yeah. 
the thing. The thing that we feel that we are chasing the most is chasing us even more. The dream that you have in your mind that you're, you, this is your best dream. God has dreamed an even bigger dream for, for you. So, so the thing is to be about that thing. Be about whatever it is. If you come in here and you see some dust on the floor, sweep that. Be the best dust sweeper that this place has ever seen. Because the same way you will sweep that dust is the same way on a set of a film I have to look inside that camera and say, that performance just wasn't right. Because the mentality didn't start by the time I get hired to direct a film. The mentality started with my work ethic and how I uh, uh, approached the little things. Yeah. If you're faithful over a, a few, God will make you ruler over many. Yeah. If you're faithful yeah. over a few. Yeah. And so when I go to a set of a film or anything, you know, um, whatever it needs to be done, I'm gonna do. I'm the director of the film, I'm the top of the food chain, yes, but if there's a cable that needs to be pulled, if there's, a, if there's an actor, if somebody's bringing me my food and I see an actor here that's waiting for theirs and they're starving, I'm gonna give my food to, to, to them because I have to serve them as they're serving uh, my, my art. And so all those things go into uh, the spirit that one must have in this business. Yeah. And just because one perceives themselves of being at the top of the food chain, then that means that you are the top servant. Wow. You're yeah. not the top to be served. Yeah. 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 And that's just how, that's how I, approach, I approach my life and, and that's why I believe God continues to bless me in the things that I do. Yeah. In that path, you talk about the director is the top of the food chain. Could you walk us through some of the roles that are um, under the leadership of a director? So some of those roles you every have. Every single person on that set. I mean, I took my, you know, we were, when we just shot Jingle Jangle, we were in London for eight months shooting that. And when, when I brought my son to the set of the film, uh, you know, it was 400 people there. I mean, we were building this whole world and there was 400 people. Yeah. And uh, I would walk in the set and Elias would see me and they would come there and say, you know, you know, director is five minutes away, five minutes away. Anything we can get you, Mr. Talbert? And then Elias, he was younger, he says, oh, they're very nice to you. They're so nice bringing you water. I said, yes. I said, well, they don't want me to uh, faint. Uh, uh, <laughs> they need to give me water because none of this stuff will work. And he says, well, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, it needs me to, to make all this stuff work, to, to get everything. He says, yeah. all of them need you to make this thing work. Mm -hmm. And I said, I said, yeah. And he says, they all work for you? <laughs> and I said, no, son, I work for all of them. Yeah. But it's the costume designer, the ward, uh, wardrobe, hair and makeup, yep. the cinematographer, the, the gaffer who lights it, the grips who move everything, the uh, art director, the yep. choreographers, the musicians, mm -hmm. you know, we, of course we get down, you know, the actors, you know, but, but yeah, it, it's, it's uh, my job when I come on the set is to be a leader, to be a motivator, to inspire, to inspire people because, um, uh, everyone is there to serve this art gotcha. and so then my job is to make it a great experience so people feel motivated to serve this art to make it the best it possibly can be because I can't be everywhere at once yeah. and I need to have soldiers and lieutenants and and people that are looking out for me because they care because they care about the spirit the energy that I create on that set they say oh we like him Huh, huh, because if they don't like you, man, this cable, he don't even know that there's a, a piece hanging out in that frame here. He gonna know when he get to the editing room, think he know every damn thing. Bet he didn't see that. Gotcha. If, you are, <laughs> if you are that dude. Yep. If you're not that dude, when I'm saying, they say action, and somebody said, hey man, you got something in that frame, man, you better watch that, oh, man, man, thank you. Well, cut, hey, such and such, hey, could you, uh, you know, would you mind? Okay, good. So that'll save me. That could save me ten thousand dollars in visual effects and post. So, so the spirit that you bring to a set yeah. 
is, is you can tell it when you see the film. You can tell when you watch some films, you're like, hmm, this film doesn't feel that good. Well, they were mad as hell on that set. Yeah. You know, they were hungry, the catering wasn't good, the chicken was dry, <laughs> you know, the Kool-Aid, they didn't put enough sugar in it. I mean, you know, these are things that on the set, but, the but you can tell when you watch a film and you're like, man, it's just something about it feels good. Yeah. Well, while they were making it, yeah. they felt good. Yeah. That's like when they say you put music in the kitchen, when you're cooking your food, your mm -hmm. food will come out better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, Forrest Whitaker, who played Jeronica's Jangle in, uh, in Jingle Jangle, there was a scene that um, uh, there was a lot of, you know, stuff going on on a set, a lot of movement, a lot of visual effects. The robot had to fly, and the little Don Juan had to, you know, a lot of things going on. And I saw him, uh, you know, kind of struggling to get into this. And this is one of the great actors who has ever <laughs> been in anything. I mean, this is one of our, he's on the Mount Rushmore, you know, not only as an actor, but just as a human being. He's one of the best human beings you'll ever, you'll ever meet. But, I, but I, I saw him struggling with one of the scenes right when Buddy was coming to life uh, for him at, at the end. And so I told the sound man to put on this, this little bed of music that, that during rehearsal we would play. And Forrest would say, he talks very sweet, he said, You can never understand what the hell for is saying. You know, he to lean in. And so w during that moment, I had the um, sound man put on that piece of music. And he looked over at me. He nodded, and he tore that scene to pieces. Because you understand, you talk about, you know, your job as a director, yes, is to, is to say, you know, where the camera goes, where should the wall be blue instead of red? Should, you know, you know, what should the pattern be? Your, your job is all that. But really, you're also there to be a therapist, to be a psychiatrist, to be a big brother, yeah. uh, to be the den daddy, uh, and to give a hug. Because us, uh, all of us that, that are in this business, dare to be in this business, yeah. uh, we need a hug. So you mentioned Jingle Jangle. So, I mean, how do we get from, if you could describe the journey from telling it like it is the play to Jingle Jangle and collaborating with the major streaming platform such as Netflix. Could you tell us some of those pivotal moments? Oh my God, that'd be a, <laughs> that'd be a mini series. <laughs> um, you know, Telling Like It Is was a 300 seat theater in Berkeley, California. Yeah. Um, and um, I was always writing poems and short stories and my college sweetheart, uh, you know, uh, broke, broke my heart and I started writing these poems. The first time I started writing, I was writing the poems and listening to Al Green. Yeah. Um, How can you mend a broken heart mm. on the record? And I was <laughs> Al Green, you know, it's like, like suicidal when you listen. <laughs> when your heart is broken and you're listening to Al Green, somebody better come, come, come scoop you up because um, some, some, something may go down wrong. And so the Al Green record is, how can you mend this broken heart? And I was playing so many times to start scratching the album. How can you mend? Can you mend? Can you mend? Can you mend? I'm like, oh, man, I messed up my... Uh, sad music. So I, <laughs> I, I took off the record and I started reading the poem, poetry because I hadn't read it. And I'm like, hmm, huh. I'm reading, I'm like, this is pretty good. And I stopped thinking about her yeah. and I'm like, oh, wait a second. Damn, Dave, you're pretty good. And I started writing short stories and all that and we ended up opening up the 300 seat theater in, in Berkeley yeah. and then Jingle Jangle 30 years later uh, opened up in 191 countries, translated in 32 languages. So again, I was faithful over those few hundred people. Yeah. You know, and God made me uh, uh, relevant to, you know, hundreds of millions of people around the world. Uh, 
uh, I would take my son to, uh, there is this toy store. If all y'all, whenever you get to London, okay, go to Hamley's. <laughs> Hamley's is the five stories of, of it, it is like, it is like the most magical place ever in downtown London. <laughs> Hamley is a, the biggest toy store in the world. So Elias, I'd take my son there all the time uh, while we were there. And, and outside of it, they would, uh, it was during the, the holidays, outside of it, they had these uh, two little British, British kids uh, dressed up as elves, and they would be singing holiday songs. Yeah. Well, after Jingle Jangle came out, uh, a friend of mine was in London scoring uh, something for another film, and she sent me a video. And the two elves that were there singing other people's song when we were making Jingle Jangle, they were dancing and singing to the song This Day from Jingle Jangle. Wow. And I tell you, uh, I wish I could tell you if you do this, then this will happen. Yeah. You know, but a lot of people along the journey prayed for me. Yeah. My great grandma, who's no, grandmother's no longer with us, who's my, my heart, you know. You know, I thought she was powerful when she was here on Earth. Mm. My God, she bumping shoulders up there with the master up in there now. Some things are happening that maybe not, should not happen <laughs> as well as they are. Yeah. But that woman is up there, she's up there making it happen for me. I'm adding my value. I'm doing everything I should be doing down here. But I got adversaries. I got advocates. Yeah. Not adversaries. I have advocates yeah. up in heaven that are making it for me. So this journey, this journey, this, this, this 30 year journey, I mean, yeah. you know, I still, I do everything I can do. I do my very best. Mm -hmm. And then I say, what else can I do better than that? Mm -hmm. yeah. And then when I answer that question, I'm like, okay, that's hot. What else can I do better than that? And so I never stop trying to elevate, you know, uh, my man Christian, who, 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 this is his brainchild. He's somebody in my go-to camp. When I'm writing a script, and I'm a beast at writing. I'm one of the great literary minds ever to do it. I do know that. Yeah. I do know that. Yeah. 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 Without question, without question. But after I have spread all, sprinkled all my magical genius pixie dust on my script, and I know it's fire. I know the yeah. thing is on fire. Yeah. I, Christian is one of the people I call. I'm like, I'm like, yo, baby brother. I said, I need you to come in and read some stuff with me. <laughs> and he says, my guy, <laughs> I'm on my way. <laughs> and we sit here with a couple of other friends, and we go over here, and we say, OK, we know it's on fire. How can we make it a backdraft? Yeah. And, 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 and he'll come and bless me with some ideas here and there. And, and, but that's how I do with everything. And then. By the time we get on the set of a film, I'm sitting with Forrest Whitaker or Felicia Rashad or Keegan Michael Key or, or you know Danny Glover or Monique or Gab Union, and we're still saying, okay, well, okay, I did, I wrote the script, it was on fire, I got with my friends like Christian, we we elevated it, now we're on the set, I'm like, yo, what you think about this? I said, well, that's good, but if you did it, so we keep building, 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 and by the time you're you're done, it's it has grown bigger than itself. So that has been my journey. That's kind of my recipe. Yeah. And uh, good isn't good enough, especially when you are blessed to have melanin in your skin. Yeah. 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 Then good isn't good enough. Good, we can't just be good. We got to be excellent. We have to be excellent just to sometimes be in the same conversation with our non-melanin brothers and sisters who are just good. Yeah. And some people look at that as a burden. Mm -hmm. I look at that as easy work. Yeah, yeah. Because I know how I was created and I know who I was created from. I know what gifts and talents were given me. I know that through this DNA, the soil I came from, I know, I, I, I know the magic that's been in the soil. I know who I am. We as melanin people, we're, we're, we're born great. Now, we are, we're, taught, we're taught not to be great. 
we're taught that we're not great, but we were born great. And so for, for, for me, it's easy work to be excellent. And I feel sorry for those who it's a little bit harder for you to be excellent. Yeah. I, don't, I don't consider my non-melanin my brothers and sisters my adversary. And that's how, I, that's, how I live, that's how I live my life. And, and we have to challenge ourselves and we have to challenge each other. And we have to unlearn some things that we have learned. We have to unlearn. And sometimes we are taught that our dreams aren't valid. We're taught that the path is to get a, when I was growing up, is get a good government job. Yeah, yeah. Get you a good government job, it got you some good benefits, and, and, and you can get you a good retirement plan. Yep. And I said, I'm all right. You going to do what? <laughs> I said, I'm going to direct. I'm going to write and direct. And the whole church came down and put blessed oil on me and laid hands on me because <laughs> they had to pray this demon up out of me. <laughs> it ain't a demon that's in you. It ain't a demon that's in you. That's God in you. And he's talking to you all the time. He's talking to you right now. The goal is to, and the path is to, clear out all the noise and the clutter so that you can hear him or her or however you perceive your creator to be. Because they're always talking to you. And that idea, that dream, that song, that script, that story that's been planted inside of you, that people told you, taught you, and you've learned that isn't valuable. It is. I mean, I don't, I, I don't even know what to say. I'm getting like emotional up here. <laughs> I think it might be a good time to, to just pivot and open it up to the audience who has questions as well. Absolutely, we'll start with you. What do you, what do, um, what do you, what do you love about God? What I love about God? Keep <laughs> up <laughs> that spirit. I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you what I love about God. And it's a story that I had with my son when he, how old are you? Six. He was about your age, maybe a little bit younger. And we were walking in the mall and there were pictures of painting of the Greek gods and Caesar and all of them. And, and uh, Elias, my son, looked up, he says, Daddy, he says, is that God? He's talking about Caesar or Zeus, whatever one of them. And I said, no. I leaned down and I said, no. I can't tell you exactly what I said to him, but I'll give you a piece of it. I said, no, basically that's an old white man. And he says, what does God look like? And I said, when you look in the mirror, you see what God looks like. <laughs> that God looks like you, God looks like your daddy. Because we were made in the image of God. So what I love about God the most is that maybe he's a beautiful black man, 6'3", bald-headed with a beard. <laughs> <laughs> part of my career is honestly what I'm doing right now. Yes. I uh, uh, 
mentor people all across the country and the world is what I love to do. It's what I believe we are supposed to do. God fills our glass. Say he gives you, you, you grow up, you, you were born with a glass and God fills that glass up, right? Fills it up with, with your gifts, your talents, your everything, right? And most people think that when you get a full glass of all this good stuff, uh, singing and dancing and acting and writing or whatever you want to do, mathematician, uh, 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 science, you know, medicine, whatever it is you're, you want. And God fills this glass up and it's all the way to the top. And you say, oh, I can't move that thing because if I move it, it's going to spill over. But here's what the thing is. The deal is God fills this glass up so that you can empty it into somebody else. Yeah. Because the beauty is then he can fill it back up with some more. So that's the thing that I love the most about is emptying this glass of, of, that's filled up with all these beautiful things and emptying it out into other people. And he always has poured more into it. What really made you want to direct? It's funny, Elias, because I, I don't really consider myself really a director. I'm a writer, a storyteller, a uh, griot in our history, in our ancestry, our African a ancestry, and the griots were the storytellers that would sit around and, and would share stories, and, and, and that is who we are. That is who your father is. I'm a storyteller. And I direct because the first play that I wrote I just wrote it, I, someone else directed it. And I would sit in the back of the theater uh, all day long for like three months while he was directing it and I was just learning. His name was Paul Rigney Roach, he was a, he was a genius out of the Bay Area. And I would sit there and watch him. And when we were about to open up, I, would, I gave him, like three days before, I gave him, the, the day before we opened up, I gave him some notes. I'm saying, you know, it would be funnier if you did this and if you did that. And then he said, great, great, great ideas. And I got a call from the producer that night to say he quit. And he called me up, he said, you gave him notes? And I said, well, yeah. He says, why would you do that? You're not the director. He knows what he's doing. You don't. And I said, but now this would be funny though if you did, he says, leave him alone. So I showed up the next day, he, he didn't show up. And the actors were like, well, what are we gonna do? I said, I'll tell you what we're gonna do. I said, we're going to change this, we're going to change that. <laughs> and and it like, they looked at me for a second, and, and then they started doing it. And you know what happened, Elias? People started laughing. We were having a good time. And the reason I direct is because we opened up the next day, because he never came back. We, we opened up the next day, and it was a standing ovation. And it was laughter that, that that theater had never heard ever before. It was riotous. The Chicago Tribune said it was side-splitting, stomach-cramping, fiercely hilarious. My first review in Richmond was a Richmond dispatch. It says, the audience roars with laughter that would make Neil Simon envious. So the only reason I direct is because I don't trust that somebody ain't going to jack my uh, stories up. <laughs> And that, that's why I'm correct. I have a question. In, in the spirit of past and, and the entire purpose of it in, in the arena of practicality, what do you say to the young, hungry writer that has written their first film or has written their first stage play for that matter? How do you get it from past idea, it's on paper already, to up and running? Well, and you can answer that for the theater or you can answer that for film and TV in any capacity. Can you take us on a brief microwave version of a journey? Yeah, well, well theater, I mean, you know, uh, theater is the oldest form of, 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 you know, kind of gathered uh, professional, uh, you know, art. And if you wrote a play that's hot, then you can put it on in your church, you can put it on in your community theater, uh, you can test it out at your church 
then you can put on a theater, charge people a dollar this week, maybe $2 the next week, maybe $10 the next week if it's good. But the theater is the most alive of all mediums because you get a chance to know what's, ha what's working and what's not working yeah. in real time. Yeah. If they're laughing, it's funny. If they're not, it's not. <laughs> Go back and fix them jokes and make them funny. And, but you can put on a play uh, anytime. And I would really say with anything is, is just do it. You know, and, um, and never accept a no from someone who doesn't have the power to say yes. I have, a, I have a condition, a hearing condition when someone says no. Now I see their lips moving. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can understand what they're trying to communicate, but it's something, and I, and I went to the doctor several times to get it checked out, and, and it just, it, it never, so now if I say I'm going, and then they say that's not a good idea, I see their lips moving, but it's kind of there because I'm not going to let your fear get in the way of my courage. Yeah. I'm not going to let your fear get in the way of my courage. So I, I don't hear you very well. Now, if you say to me, man, that's a, I, I think you got something there. How about this? How about, now I can hear that very well. But if I've been given an idea, I know it's valuable. I know it's valuable. Now, it may not be the best version of itself, but I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna put it on. And I would say the people that have a play First, I would say put it on. It's the easiest thing. It doesn't cost you any money. You can put it on in your living room. All for you, a play you need is some actors to say the words and an audience to enjoy it. And then, you know, I started out in that 300 seat theater and we sold out 18 shows in a row. We were 18 shows in a row. And the, and the promoter who was promoting one of the big plays, a play called Beauty Shop back in the day, Came, came to the theater to see it and took us on tour. So, so we, we went from a 300 seat theater, I opened up in my hometown, Washington DC at the Constitution Hall, which was 3,200 seats. We were selling more tickets than Luther Vandross. He was on sale at the same time as my play was on. And the promoter called me and said, David, I've never seen it in my life. I'm like, Every, I like everything all right? He says, you are kicking Luther and uh, Van Dross's ass. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt a little bad because I love Luther. <laughs> he was going to take that ass with him. <laughs> Luther, Luther's going to he's, he's gonna have to take it. <laughs> yeah, he's going to have to take it. So, uh, so that's the theater. Do it. Put it on. Get readings. Get some actors. Read it. Um, and and find a village of people that believe in you, but who will challenge you. Yeah. Yeah. Don't just get the, just don't get the grandmama and the auntie, that's all right, baby, God <laughs> has blessed you. And he going, you got a gift, baby. God <laughs> has told me about it, and I pray by your head. And now, now, now all that stuff is wonderful. <laughs> that's what grandma's job is. Absolutely. To, to tell you, you can do it. <laughs> but now you need to have some people around you who are going to challenge you, yeah. push you to, for it to be the best version of itself. When it comes to film, which requires at a certain level money, yeah. it, it, it requ you need some cameras, you need some lights, yep. you need some uh, microphones, you need some actors, you need some, some chicken that's moist <laughs> uh, to eat on the set. You need catering. So you need some money. Um, what, I would, what I always say to people that want to write in a screenplay is find you a mentor mm -hmm. in this business who is doing what it is you want to do. And you may say, how am I going to, how, how am I going to do that? It's easier than you think. Uh, most of, of the writers all have Instagram pages, they have whatever, you can, by hook or crook, they, they'll do uh, talk like this conversation here. And, and I mentor a lot of writers all the time because 
what you want to make sure of, what I do, the people I mentor, is make sure that that script is really flushed out. And I would say to screenwriters is go online, find your favorite movies, and go online and type script to insert favorite movie. It's online. Read it. Read it. What's your next favorite movie? Go online. Script to such and such. Read it. All the DNA, all the intel. If it's your favorite movie, it's your favorite movie for a reason because somebody was good at doing what they did and got it made. So if the information is out there for you, why aren't you using it? People tell me all the time, they, you know, I love your plays, David. Uh, tell me how to write a play. Now, I do, on each of my DVDs of my plays, I do a director's commentary. I, do, I talk and tell you how I put together all that. I say, well, did, you, did, you, did, you see, did you pick up the director's commentary? <laughs> No, nah, see, uh, oh, oh, <laughs> no, nah, see, huh? But you want me to sit here and tell you everything. So you want me to be the director's commentary for you, huh? So I'm a DVD now. <laughs> <laughs> Do your homework. Yep. Yep. Do your homework. It, it is not a, um, it is not a magical, uh, um, uh, pixie that's going to come out or a fairy that's going to come out and pop you on top of the head and all of a sudden you're a screenwriter. Do your work. One of my favorite, uh, um, it is, uh, uh, see I ain't been to church in a while, um, is, uh, it will come to me and my grandmother's is up there, mm, mm, shaking her head right there. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, it will come to me about what, what you must do to fine tune whatever, and I know the scripture is right on the top of my uh, uh, tongue. I will get it back and put it online. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, hi, Mrs. Taub. How you doing? Um, pretty good, even better. I first wanna thank you. Should I stand up? Okay. Uh, I first wanna thank you for filling my spirit today. Um, it has definitely quickened my spirit and sharpened me. I'm moving forward on my path on this journey. My question is, you spoke about, I mean, you, you, I definitely feel you're a man of great faith. You spoke about declaring what you wanted to be and what you were going to do to your, family, to your faith based community, and they all came together and wanted to pray the demons out of you, like you said. How did you transition with your faith by being challenged with the community of people that? To up faith. How did you move forward in that? Can you talk about that? I got in a four-cylinder car <laughs> and drove 3,000 miles away. <laughs> it's hard for people that have known you your whole life, yeah. that have a vision of you, yeah. and, 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 and that vision is something you have shared, you had of you. It's hard for them to see another vision and they don't mean any harm, but you have introduced them to someone that they have grown to learn. The, the trick is you have to reintroduce yourself to people. You know, I think Jay-Z said, allow me to reintroduce myself. My name is Hove. <laughs> allow me to reintroduce myself. And that's what you, that's what you have to do. All, often, you have to reintroduce yourself, and sometimes people aren't interested in this reintroduction. Yeah. It's called upsetting their absolutes. They know one thing, they've accepted one thing, they, this box is fine. Why the hell you want to get out of it? <laughs> I can put a nice pillow, you want another pillow to be in this box? I can put a blanket, you, would you like that? Maybe I can cut a hole in it and maybe so you can have some air conditioning, you need some ventilation, you have a hard breathing. Why would you want to get out of this box? People are comfortable with you in your box. You have to be uncomfortable with that box. There was something that my um, grandmother told me that they did when down south. They said they used to put they're grasshoppers. They used to collect these grasshoppers. These grasshoppers could jump up six feet up in the air, and they did a thing. They would get these grasshoppers, and they would put them in this little jelly jar, and they would poke holes in the top. 
and that grasshopper that was jumping six feet, they came back the next day and the grasshopper was just jumping, you know, jumping up because he couldn't get any higher than this lid, this six inch lid. So they undid the lid and put the grasshopper out. And now you know how high that grasshopper was jumping? Six inches. Because he had been trained. He had been unlearned. His instincts was to jump six feet high. Yeah. But people are comfortable with us being in that jelly jar and they don't want to kill us. They'll poke enough holes in it so we can breathe and we can live. But they're comfortable with us being in that jelly jar. And then that dream that we had, you stay in that jelly jar long enough, even when they take the lid out, guess what? You don't have that dream no more. Yeah. So you have to teach yourself and remind yourself that these dreams you have were created for you to soar up to the sky. And, and sometimes you just got to get the hell out of Dodge. <laughs> you, look at, you look at all the Bible stories, you look at not one of them stayed where they were. Abraham didn't, no. uh, Jesus didn't. No. I mean, he, went, he dipped out for, he dipped out when he was 14, his father was talking about, you build this, uh, now give me the nail, uh, uh, Jesus, now give me the nail, damn it, Jesus, that ain't the nail I need, I need the screw. And, and he's like, well, look here, now I need to be about my father's business. And he said, well, I, you are, you, your business to your father is to get that damn nail so I can fix a, your carpenter, Jesus. He says, hmm, hmm. And he bounced, and he came back. He was walking on water. <laughs> While he was there, he was just trying. All he was doing is nailing this thing in. He came back, and he was walking on water. Sometimes you got to bounce out, come back, walking on water. Literal, uh, metaphorical. Every time I create something, I feel like I'm soaring. People say, damn, Dave, how'd you come with that idea? I said, I didn't. My soul just hovered for a while, and I got in touch, and it was given to me. And, and I'm just a vessel in which it flowed through. But I'll take credit for it. I'll, I'll cut the check, because God don't need the money. <laughs> you, you can pay me for this, this idea that I have. The scripture I was looking for is study to show thyself approved, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Study to show thyself approved. That means the work you have to put into it. Study work. That's scriptural. That's the doctrine. No, there is no shortcuts. There is not an elevator to success. My good friend Jennifer Lewis says, there is no elevator to success. Take the stairs. <laughs> I just have to say, I've been incredibly blessed by your, your nuggets of wisdom today. So many notes, um, so powerful, so connected to God, I love it. Um, but my last, I guess the question for you is, could you talk to us about your last play and the transition from your last play into your first film? Can you talk to us about that story? The, the play to the film was a play called Love in the Nick of Time that Morris Chestnut uh, was starring in. It was his first time doing uh, theater. And uh, we were at Spreckles uh, in San Diego, Spreckles Theater in San Diego. Can I have uh, one more? Absolutely. Got it. We, we were at Spreckles Theater in San Diego. Thank you. And um, uh, Tyler Perry, who we were on the circuit, uh, he came a few years after me, but. Um, he was touring on the circuit and, and we would, you know, share, share ideas and dreams and information with each other all the time. And he had come out with a movie called The Diary of Mad Black Woman based on one of his plays. So um, uh, there was a buzz right now where, where who are these popular black playwrights? And it was just really Tyler Perry and myself. Um, and so my play was touring and all the studios wanted to see, okay, maybe, maybe he, he can do business like, like Tyler did. Uh, but I was writing this original story called First Sunday, was my first film. And um, so this three, three of the studio heads came from different studios, came up to San Diego to see the play. So it was 
2,000 people at Freckles Theater. I said, Morris. I came back to I said, Morris, now, I need this audience to go crazy so I can get this movie deal. And he said, Dave, they already go crazy when I step on stage. I said, I need them to go a little crazy. I said, you know that scene when you take off your shirt? <laughs> And you just, you know, we got Velcro in it, so you kind of like, you rip it, and it kind of comes off like the black Superman. <laughs> I said, what we're going to do is we're going to put buttons on that shirt. And I want you to slowly take one button off at a time. <laughs> and he says, they're going to lose their mind, Dave, if I do that. I said, hey, exactly. <laughs> Morris got on stage. That special came on there. That music hit. Morris did. they like, ah! He put that nigga on me, took that shirt off. I mean. You could have called the paramedics in that place. <laughs> Afterwards, it was a bidding war for my first film. I and mean, that's how it was from. But, but again, what I was a proven entity as a playwright and a theater director. And so you have to prove yourself a success in something so that people can say, well, then if they put some money and they gave you a bigger canvas, maybe you could be even more successful. And that's really what film was for me. I love theater. I'm a playwright to my bones. Uh, but the canvas stopped being big enough for me. And I needed a bigger canvas, and that's what film has become for me. Thank you for pouring into us and really, I mean, I, this was like a spiritual <laughs> transaction, you know what I'm saying? Like, you can feel it when it's real, yeah. when it's honest, yeah. and when it comes from the right place. Yeah. Not a lot of people can do that. Yeah. You, have to thank, you have to thank uh, Pastor Annie Mae Woods. Because um, I sat back in the back of that holiness church, and I saw people come in as alcoholics and leave out. Still alcoholics, but. <laughs> <laughs> but at least they felt that maybe they shouldn't be. Yeah. And I watched people's lives be changed by words, the word of God, the stories they would tell from Bible stories. And, and that stuck with me. And. Um, you know, all my family, the pastors and preachers, everybody except for me. But I, I, I believe this is my ministry. And, and stories and sharing and touching lives through this medium is. So you got, you got Pastor Annie Mae Woods and Elder Ronald H. Woods, my uncle, assistant pastor. You have, you have them to have them to yes. So here on Paths, we do believe in speaking things into existence. What is one thing that you're praying for to happen next with your career? I am praying for the opportunity to open the doors for others to pursue their passions, really. Yeah. Um, I'm starting a program, um, um, a partnership with USC uh, and, and HBCU schools to enhance uh, their um, access. Yeah. Uh, there's a program I'm doing with Netflix uh, and my wife and I are doing called Lights, Camera, Access. Yeah. And, um, and so, I mean, that's, the, that's, that's really what my dream is and, and what I'm not only speaking into existence but bringing into existence. That's and this beautiful, I was taking on a tour here at this beautiful place, and my God, I had no idea what was going on in here. I mean, I think I'm doing something my little bit. Y'all got, <laughs> y'all got, you got, look, five, six-year-old handling cameras? <laughs> what in the world is going on here? <laughs> You're going to take my job, little mama. <laughs> You're going to take my job, little mama. Oh, that's a beautiful thing. It just does my heart good. So this is what I'm supposed to be doing. I got my son here. I got, I got my son here with me. <laughs> this dude here. <laughs> so this is really what, uh, what, what, you know, as far as my career, yeah. there's not one thing I can't do that I'm not doing. There's yeah. not, I'm blessed. I am, I am, I have more work 
uh, the scripture says, see if I won't open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing you won't have room enough to receive. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. It is, it's, it's raining blessings. It's raining blessings. It's a torrential downpour of blessings. And, and so that's happening. Now it's about, uh, you know, the legacy of what, what it is I'm here for and to do and to give back which starts with my beautiful wife of 24 years who produces with me. Uh, and my son, uh, my son Elias, and oh my God. And, uh, and my friends like Christian, who blessed me. So whatever you all need, we're gonna help amplify this place and get some, and get some folks uh, in here to, to you, know, you know, drop some Duckets. Yeah. <laughs> and not and not as they say in the church, and not the kind that jingles, the kind that wrinkles. <laughs> well y'all heard it here on past. I mean, the harvest is plentiful, yeah. but the laborers are few, yeah. and that's why we need you. Y'all yeah. tune in next time here on Path. <laughs>